Brubaker, who lived up in Rathco Township and near Mastersonville. And then he had sons from Hans that lived on this farm right here. So um, I am descendant one time. And you'll see in this presentation, I have lots of maps because I love to draw maps. And uh, maps are a way that I kind of uh, can figure out things and, and such. So I'll have a lot of interesting maps, just like this one that you see here. Uh, do we have a pointer as well? Or yeah, it'll the, this, um, this mouse is a pointer here as well. So if you follow my, my mouse over this map here, we are, here's Millersville, and we are just north, um, Roristown would be like up here off the map, and we're stationed probably about right here. This might even work better, let's see. Yes, yeah, so we're just off the map. Where we're stationed right now is just off this map, and uh, I didn't, I didn't make this intricate map just for this reunion, it's for other things too. Um, but you can see here the Native American presence in Lancaster County during the colonial period. And I'm talking about colonial period, I'm talking about from about 1710 through 1763. Remember Hans was here in 1717, so he would have been here at the same time the Native Americans lived here. And here, Conodago, along the, the Susquehanna, we're gonna talk about that town. Conestoga Indian Town, Conodago and Conestoga are simply derivatives of the same word. Uh, Conodago would be an older way of saying Conestoga. Um, Indians didn't write anything down. Native Americans didn't have a written language, but we know that because Maryland is a lot older of a colony than Pennsylvania is. Maryland was established in the, in the 1630s, and Maryland talked about these Indians up here that live in Conodago here. This is along River Road in Manor Township. Conestoga Indian Town here, Indian Marker Road goes right through this tract. This is 414 acres in Manor Township. This is another site here that's called the Robert site. Not that the Indians used the name Roberts, but the landowner's last name was Roberts when that was excavated back in the 1960s. These are some of the old roads that go through the area. You're familiar with the Hans Herr house, it's over here. Many of you who descends from Hans Herr, I mean, most of us that are local would descend from Hans Herr as well. Um, that's 1719. And then uh, we have uh, just in the last, uh, since, since 2012, we set up a Native American longhouse right beside the, the Herr house. Um, that project is going on here. We call that the Lancaster longhouse. That, that showcases, I have a slide later in, in the presentation that showcases um, how the Native Americans lived. We have some artifacts there, some pottery, um, um, furs and hides, and, and um, there are presentations that go on there uh, regularly for school groups and for, for tourists and people that come in come into the area. So when um, Hans Brubaker and the other Mennonite colonists came here, um, there, there's an Indian settlement that's here in Conestoke Indian Town. Uh, by that time, it's, it's only a few hundred people, but in the 1600s, there are several thousand people that would have lived along the river here. Um, they were called the Susquehannock tribe. And so we'll talk about those a bit, a bit as well. Let's go on to, um, if I, I can go, yeah, okay, this just slides through, good. So uh, here we have archeological evidence here in Lancaster County that Indians had lived here since the Ice Age. Um, if you look on a, an old map, or even a current map of Pennsylvania, you'll see something strange with the rivers. That you can, if you look at it carefully, as, as the Juniata River comes from southeastern Pennsylvania and flows north, it begins to flow south again before it enters the Susquehanna. That's because at one point there was a big block of ice, or Ice Age, covered the northern half of uh, Pennsylvania. And the southern half, as the ice was melting, there was abundant fresh water there. These Native Americans came from Asia um, and began to, to move further and further east. In fact, um, their legends say that they've moved towards the rising sun. So towards the sunrise instead of towards the sunset, they kept moving east. And they would have moved through the area south of all that ice that was melting, because in that area they had lots of fresh water, there would have been abundant uh, resources in terms of um, animals as well that we don't have today, such as uh, mammoths and mastodon and even woolly rhinoceros. 
we're talking about 10 to 12,000 years ago. Those animals all became extinct, um, probably through them hunting them. But um, there is ample evidence that they lived in this area. At that time, even along the river, along the Susquehanna, there's, um, there's rock carvings and Stone Age tools that go back about 8,000 years. And we find that they are farmers. And this is one thing that often when we, don't, we, when we think about Native Americans, we don't realize that they were farmers. Not farmers the way Europeans are farmers, but if you think about the foods that we eat today, most of the foods in terms of vegetables that we eat today come from Native Americans. Think about potatoes, all the things we do with potatoes. This is Native American. Corn, peppers, beans, any kind of bean, the green beans, the lima beans, all those are Native Americans. Tomatoes are from Native Americans. Now, what am I missing? I mean, those are the, the big vegetables that we eat today. Am I right? I'm missing wheat. Wheat comes from Middle East. So any of our bread products, they're not Native American, they come from the Middle East. Peas come from the Middle East as well. And cabbage and carrots. Our German ancestors would have eaten lots of cabbage. So there's a hundred ways to make cabbage in Germany, right? You know, so, so cabbage comes from Europe, but the vegetables that we eat that are so common and popular today, particularly potatoes, and, um, and corn, maize, are Native American. Plus tomatoes, we use tomatoes for everything. That's Native American as well. So Native Americans were predominantly agriculturalists. Much of that work was done by the women. The men did the hunting and the women did the farming. And some of those products, like corn comes from Mexico. I have a slide that shows how it got to Pennsylvania. The corn comes from Mexico, potatoes come from South America. But some of these products are actually local to this area and the Ohio River Valley. Um, one thing that happens to me, you know, uh, my, my wife is very, and I am as well, very trying to be environmentally conscious. So we don't um, fertilize our yard anymore and things like that and try to, try to be more natural. And so what I'm noticing is that, you know, if you fertilize, everything becomes a monoculture in your yard. You just have this pretty grass and such, but when you don't, I'm getting strawberries coming up. <laughs> and they're these little native strawberries. They're not very big, and they don't taste very good. I tried them. They don't, they're not sweet like our, our hybridized strawberries are here uh, that we buy in the markets. But they are naturally, locally grown strawberries. And um, this, is a, this is a Native American product that they, they had cultivated um, for years and years, hundreds of years at least, before, before we arrived here. Squash is the same way. Uh, this yellow neck squash, like you see here, um, we would maybe call it a gourd. Um, this comes from the Ohio River Valley, um, just to the west of us here. This would have been grown by Native Americans here as well, as, as well as the variety of pumpkins and things like that that we have uh, here in the area as well. And these, these things as well. Jerusalem artichoke, these are a type of sunflower. Of course, all sunflowers are Native American. But the, the big ones that you see here are more or less hybridized to, to get that big um, in more recent years. Um, but these sunflowers that are called the Jerusalem artichoke come from, um, come from being cultivated by Native Americans, and they ate the roots. The tubers were like sweet potatoes. So, and sweet potatoes are also Native American, by the way. But they ate the roots of these sunflowers, plus they used the seed. And this, uh, this erect knotweed, that is often pulled out of your gardens because we see it as a weed today. Native Americans would have used this. Uh, they would have grown this and they would have chewed it um, when they're on trips and such because it helps to quench the, quench the thirst and keep, keep one hydrated. So all these plants could have been used. Um, this plant up in the right, the right uh, upper corner here, lamb's quarters, this is a weed that grows in my garden today. Native Americans would have used this and which would have actually grown this as farms and this prostrate knotweed here, and sumpweed. So these are things that if you, um, if you um, hoe or plow a field, these things will just come up naturally now. But they were planted by Native Americans here for years and years and generations, and now they're just coming up. And fruit as well. How many have eaten a pawpaw? Not many. You can, you can find pawpaws around 
get here. You know, if you go to Manor Township to Turkey Hill, and if you take, there's, there's a nice bike route that was the old rail trail up along the river there. And if you go up in the hill, uh, you'll see pawpaw groves that are at least as old as the Native Americans were here 400 years ago, 500 years ago. There are groves there. Of course, those trees aren't that old, but their ancestors of those trees were there when the Native Americans lived in this area. And mulberries, um, these, uh, these uh, various um, uh, fruits from, from the nightshade family as well, just like um, potatoes and tomatoes are, they're indigenous to, to this area and were used and cultivated by Native Americans. And of course, we can't forget this one, corn. There's a, there's a big mystery as to how corn originates. When we look at the genetics, it's a combination between teosente, which is this plant on the left side that comes from the, the highlands of southern Mexico and Guatemala, and tripsacum, which is the plant here on the right side. And uh, when we try to combine this together today genetically, it doesn't work. Um, we can't get offspring from such a combination. But somehow the Native Americans figured out how to combine these together between five and 7,000 years ago, and they began to grow corn in southern Mexico. Now, I was at Mesa Verde, this is a few years ago. I was at Mesa Verde, and, and, and the guy gave a presentation about this. And he said, when you combine these together, or when they combine these together, they didn't get what we perceive as corn right away. They got something that eventually became corn. So they started out with something like what's on the left side. And the way that he talked about this is pretty significant, because Native Americans their, their spirituality is tied into, tied into the earth and tied into everything that they were doing in life. So everything becomes a spiritual practice, including planting the seeds and harvesting the seeds and eating the seeds. So what ended up happening here, as we understand it, is as they began to grow corn that looked like what we have on the left, they would take the best of those seeds and they would save them. Rather than eating them, they would save the best of those seeds. They would save them for the next year. And when they planted them the next year, they planted them in a ceremonial way that was blessing the Creator. Now what happens if you do this season after season, year after year, over hundreds of years and even <coughs> thousands of years, what happens when you take the best of the seeds and put them back in the ground? What happens to the genetics? You're going to get something that's on the right side after a while. You see that? So they're taking the best, and every time they're, they're selecting, just like we do when we, when we um, genetically select the best traits today, they're doing it, but they're doing it as a, a spiritual practice. You know, in agriculture, they're taking the best seeds, planting them the next year, and so what happens to the corn? It gradually gets bigger, gradually gets, the years get bigger, and we end up getting the corn like we have today. Pretty amazing if you think about it. Now here's a map that shows how this, how this came about just in a time frame, because uh, the corn that's grown in the, the highlands of southern Mexico is a different variety than what's grown around here. But you see there I have uh, 7,000 to 10,000 years ago. They're growing corn, teosente, and and tripsapkin are coming together there. By, um, by um, 2100 BC, um, corn is found in the Navajo region of uh, southwestern US, Southern California, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, that region. By 3000 years ago, 1000 BC, it's found in the Mississippi Valley. Um, what I have there in red, we call that, or the, the historians and such, call that the, the Eastern Agricultural Complex. It's a, a, a new system of agriculture that is localized to the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys, includes squash and, and, um, and beans and corn. And then by, by about um, uh, 1,000 to 3,000 uh, BC, that, that corn is coming into the upper Ohio River Valley and even over to um, to the Susquehanna area, like you see here, and also found its way all the way up to the Iroquois that lived in Canada. So uh, I believe uh, Kitchener and St. Jacobs area is right about where I'm pointed to right there. 
and they grow corn there, don't they? Yes, yes. So, so, so um, we have corn that's extended up about this far, and I think now with hybridizing, we've gone even further north. The Native Americans went about this far with it. We've taken it even a little bit further north. We can shorten the growing seasons now to 50 days or so, and it's gone even further north. So that's kind of the story of how corn came to this area. And of course, um, our ancestors, our Brubaker ancestors, they knew about corn in Europe before they got here because um, Christopher Columbus took corn back to Spain, 1492. And, and corn, corn is a type of thing that's so nutritious, you can store it for the winter in holes in the ground. It'll keep in bags or leather bags. It'll keep, you can dry it, you can make cornmeal out of it. So, so it's a good staple vegetable to keep through the winter season. And the, the, early, the early European explorers um, found that very valuable. Um, the early colonies, such as uh, Jamestown and, and Plymouth Rock, those areas um, could not survive if it wasn't for Indian corn through the winter. Christopher Columbus took corn back to Spain. By the 1520s, they were growing corn all through Spain because of its value. And I was, I was trying to figure out, well, what's the earliest documentation of corn in Switzerland? Because our ancestors, brewbakers, came from Switzerland. 1581 is what I found. Now, maybe it's earlier than that. But by 1581, they were growing Native American corn in Switzerland. They called it the foreign grain. So they, they were growing corn before they came here. And as they came here, um, naturally, they continued to grow corn as they were here. Corn is probably, I, I don't think there's any debate about this, the most successful agricultural product that we have in the world. And it was grown by Native Americans. So a few other things as we go on here. And this is all localized here. There's the, the Susquehanna River. And uh, we have lots of petroglyphs found on, on rocks in the river. Um, some of these have been dis, uh, submerged by the dams. You can see there on my map, uh, the ones in red are, are submerged. Uh, this map uh, is uh, north is like up this way. So I have it kind of angled. Uh, here's the boundary between Pennsylvania and Maryland and uh, Marietta, Columbia, Washington Borough, towns you're familiar with here. There were um, rock carvings throughout the whole area and some of them are now submerged by, by the dams. This one here in particular is uh, found just south of the Safe Harbor Dam, where the, where the Conestoga comes out to, to the Susquehanna and meets the Susquehanna. We don't know um, a lot of the meanings on these rock carvings, but um, these, uh, these squiggly lines uh, end up lining up with the, the time that the sun sets during the summer solstice. So the Native Americans had the same sky that, that we did in Europe. So when you look at things like Stonehenge and things that are organized according to uh, the solstice when the sun is at its highest point during the year versus its lowest point, they would have made markings and such in relation to those changes of seasons as well. And there's also um, one, you know, um, Lancaster County, um, why, why, did, why did our ancestors settle here? Because it's very fertile, the land is very fertile and they were farmers as well. That's why the Native Americans live here and we have more artifacts in Lancaster County than in anywhere else in Pennsylvania concerning Native Americans. So, so um, what, there, there is one, there is one, um, one uh, petroglyph like this that's in that area that points up to the Conestoga River, and it's a, it's a man that's quite stocky, um, let's say fat, pointing up that way, and then there's a skinny man pointing over to York County. So, <laughs> so I, think it, I think it's saying something, right? Um, you know, <laughs> these days we use fertilizer, and York County can produce as much uh, agricultural products as we do in Lancaster County. But back in those times, Lancaster County was always a, really a, a fertile area. And it's saying, well, if you want, if you want, um, mm -hmm. if you want to be well fed, you come to Lancaster County, right? I, mean, I think that's what it's saying. I mean, we don't know what all these, all these symbols and everything mean in concer concerning <laughs> the petroglyphs of Native Americans, but that's one, that's one that's pretty obvious, right? You know, so, and it continues on today. I think <laughs> we, we would say the same thing. If you want to be well fed, come to Lancaster County. So th this this one's a bit interesting because we have we have um, two we have lots of different tribes, but we have two 
large encompassing groups of tribes. And the dividing line, more or less, between those tribes falls right here in Lancaster County. We have the Algonquin-speaking people, which would be the people in the pink here. They would include the Lenni Lenape, the Delaware, the Nanakoke, the Piscataway, the Shawnee. They're all Algonquin-speaking peoples. Um, they, um, they settled along the, the eastern shore. Um, and you can see here where we live, where we live, where we are here today is right in this area. We're pretty close to the boundary between the Algonquin speaking tribes and the Uruguayan tribes, which would include the Susquehannock, the Erie, the Susquehannock are a subset of the Seneca up here in the Finger Lakes. These are all the Uruguayan speaking tribes, and these are all the Algonquin speaking tribes. Now, we're not, um, we're not looking at like political boundaries the way we do today and such. So boundaries between tribes and tribal groups would have been the watersheds. Lancaster County falls into the watershed of the Conestoga River that flows into the Susquehanna. If you go over to the east to Chester County, that watershed is the Brandywine River that flows into the Christiana River that goes into the Delaware Bay. So, the dividing line between Chester County and Lancaster County is pretty much the dividing line between these Algonquin speaking groups that are to the east and the Uruguayan speaking groups that are to the west. That's all before the colon colonists arrived. So the first significant colonist to arrive was Captain John Smith, founding Jamestown, 1607. I was down, I was down there in 2007 when they celebrated the the 400th uh, or commemorated the 400th uh, anniversary of this and he and his um, scribe or recorder or whatever you would call it they they did a lot of exploration throughout the chesapeake bay of course the spanish were were uh, were involved in the south and were coming up and he wanted to document and report on everything that he saw to claim it for england so when they set up they set up uh, jamestown in the summer of of 1607. Uh, by the following summer, in August of 1608, he took a small boat with 13 men from the colony and he went up and, and recorded all these little towns and his experiences of these different different Indian tribes all over this area. And he met with um, the, the, the Powhatan, the chief of, of uh, the area in green. Um, the area was called Powhatan and the chief was also called Powhatan. Um, and he described all that in his journal. And he also came up here to the, to the mouth of what is now the Susquehanna River. And he describes meeting these, this group called the Massawomack, the Takwa, and the Susquehanna. The Takwa were an Algonquin speaking group that spoke more or less the same language as the Palatan down here. The Susquehanna and the Massawomack spoke this language that nobody understood. He talks about these people. He has the most respect for the Susquehannock. He talks about them as being a mighty people. Of course, uh, John Smith um, was about five foot four inches tall. And when he met this chief that was over six foot tall, he describes this in detail. And in fact, he, 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 he talked about it in his journal. He said, we, we first met with the Takwa. And he, and he asked them, well, who, who, um, who do you pay your allegiance to? And they said, we pay our allegiance to the Susquehanna that lived two days walk up the river. This would be Washington Borough today, just right out here. And John Smith says, well, I'd like to, I'd like to meet the chief. And he did this when he approached every, every tribe. He did kind of the same thing. I'd like to meet the chief. I'd like to talk to the chief. And they said, well, you wait at the base of the river, and we'll be back. It takes us two days to go up, two days to come back. We'll be back on the fourth day, and you can meet the chief. And when they, and when they do that, he comes down and he describes this chief. And uh, here's, here's the description. Right there is how he looked. He says, this chief came out more than six feet tall. He had, he had the head of a bear on his shoulder, and his arm his arm came out of the mouth of the bear. And then he had, there was a strap on the back. He had another head of a bear on the other shoulder with his arm coming out of that other bear. 
Now you can, can you imagine this, meeting this guy? <laughs> In 1608, right? Yeah. You know, just at the base. I mean, we're talking about this is this is 25 miles from here. Um, in 1608, 400 years ago, this interaction of cultures. Um, an impressive guy, nothing but respect. John Smith had tremendous respect for the Susquehannocks. They were they were a military people, a warrior people, um, and he was he was more or less like-minded, I suppose, um, but had a lot of respect for this, and he talks about that in his journals. Um, he also describes um, that they um, they made this uh, this sound, this war cry that sounds like well, a typical Indian cry. It's the first description of our, our typical Indian cry. He talks about it as a as a cry that's like a cave. Here I have it here. Oh, their language babbled as a great voice. The last sentence there, in a vault or cave, as an echo. So that would be the, the common war cry that we that we even have represented in the movies, right? <laughs> Yeah, so this, this is the first time that we have that, that, that described or talked about. One thing that was surprising, though, when John Smith met the Susquehannocks, he was surprised they already had some metal goods that were French. Now, how could they have French goods? This is 1608. Well, it so happens in 1599, the French set up a small colony called Teotihuacan on the, the St. Lawrence River up in Quebec. And then later, just the year before this, they founded Quebec City and then Montreal. So it's just in those few short years that the Susquehannocks got access to French goods from Quebec. There, there was a trade network that existed between the Susquehannocks and these other tribes that went up north at least to Quebec and south at least to North Carolina at the time that the colonists first arrived. So uh, it was very extensive. The farming network was, was quite extensive, and the trade network was very extensive. They just didn't use metal before that, and they didn't um, have any writing before that. Here are some of the, some of the artifacts that were found at local sites here along, along the Susquehanna and Manor Township. Some combs made out of bone, uh, baskets, that are, that are clay. You, you see a small uh, effigy here on this basket, um, uh, face or, or an animal. Um, we did discuss this, uh, this map already. Other, other um, objects that are found from what we call the Strickler site along the river. Some of these are metal. They would have been traded with uh, the New European colonists, um, but, but also clay pots here and uh, beadwork and different tools and that type of thing. Um, this map here shows the extent of the Susquehannocks in terms of not where they lived. They lived, they lived here at Conodago and some, some sites along the Conestoga and the Octorera and such, but they, they um, demanded tribute from other tribes, including the Delaware, that were out here towards Philadelphia and even down here, all the way to, this would be like, here, here would be Rehoboth Beach area. Um, down here, this would be Southern Maryland here. Here's Chincoteague, they didn't quite go down that far, but Southern Maryland, Salisbury, Maryland area. Um, this is, this is a, a three hour drive today. But the Susquehannocks had, had dominion or control, we could say, over all these areas. Um, these, these tribes paid tribute to them. Basically, they went around and, and they said, we will protect you from your enemies, but you need to give us 10% of your corn or you know, a certain, a certain uh, tribute to, to them. They were, they were kind of developing a nation the way that the Europeans did in a century or two earlier. If you, if you study your European history, Germany is all these city-states and independent cities that kind of come together under a common language and culture. The same thing was happening here. Just a few decades later, the Susquehannocks would have it in this area, the Powhatan would have it here in the south, in Virginia, and in part of Maryland. And um, one of the reasons why when the colony of Maryland was founded in 1632 here at St. Mary's, they couldn't push up very far because these guys were in the way. And one of the reasons why um, Pennsylvania wasn't founded until so late 1682 is because the Susquehannocks were here. 
before that time. Otherwise, we'd probably be in Maryland today. Because Maryland would have just kept pushing up further and further. Uh, so it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting when you look, when you look at this, this history. What happened to these Susquehannocks, though? Well, in the 1660s, this, this town here, this town here had between 2,500 and 3,000 people. So it wasn't just a town, it was a city. In fact, Washington Borough today might have 500 people. But back 400 years ago, there were 2,000 people living there, or 2,500 people living there. There were two epidemics of smallpox, 1661 and 1663, that decimated the population. And then after that time, they moved over, they abandoned this town. William Penn talks about this town being in ruins. They abandoned this town, and they moved over to the York County side of the river in two different, two different groups. So there's two towns over there, about 900 people in each of those towns. And then later, Later, they surrender to Maryland. Maryland takes a bunch of the Susquehannocks from both these towns, and they move them to a reservation down towards Washington, D.C., so down in this area along the Potomac. So this is, a, this is a few hundred miles. Now, not all of them go. Many of them scatter into the woods, but not all of them go. Um, and after that time, the ones that stayed behind apparently come back and settle in the area that's called Conestoga Indian Town. So going back to my map here, Conodago gets ruined. They move across the river. Some of them move to a reservation along the Potomac, and the others come back to their homeland and settle at Conestoga Indian Town. So by the time William Penn gets here, 1682, there's a group at Conestoga Indian Town of Susquehannock Indians, a remnant of them. <coughs> William Penn returns in 1701, meets with them, smokes the peace pipe with them, dances with them, and basically signs his contract saying, we, we are like one body, two hands. We are, we are the same, same people. We're all, we're all humans. William Penn, being an enlightened man, saw things this way. Not everybody did. Not everybody did, but William Penn certainly did. And William Penn invited our ancestors here, too, because of, of uh, like-mindedness in terms of our, our spirituality and such. So they, they settled here. Um, William Penn had originally had granted them 16,000 acres, which is basically the size of Manor Township here. And then um, William Penn dies in 1718. Our ancestors come in 1717. And as William Penn dies, his uh, land agent, um, who was uh, his land manager, begins to open up this land for European settlement. Mm -hmm. And who are among the first to come? Yes, Our Brubaker ancestors, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And not just, I mean, I have Souther ancestors and a lot of different ancestors that came into this land. But our Brubaker ancestors would have been among some of the first that came into this area. Now, they didn't live right here at Conestoga Indian Town lived up here, as you know, but this isn't too far, a few miles at the most. You can go by and go, go to Indian Marker Road, look it up in your GPS. You can go by where, um, where this Conestoga Indian Town was, even, even today, even this afternoon. It's just in Manor Township, not too far away. <coughs> and and that, is, that is the, the area where the, the Native Americans lived there through 1760. Now, now they got, there were a few hundred there at first when William Penn met them, but their population grew less and less. As um, Europeans were settling in and began to farm the areas around here, the population of the Native Americans grew less and less. Some of them, of course, moved, moved further west and further north. And then um, I do have a slide in here that discusses the, the Massacre. Here's my slide about returning to Conestoga. And a few other maps here. Thank you. Here's Conestoga, right here. Here's where the Mennonites first settled. And here's um, colonial European colonists encroaching further and further west. Show you another slide here. 
right here. We have uh, the demise of Conestoga Indian Town was in 1763. Some of you know this story. Um, a group of Scotch-Irish from Paxton up near Harrisburg came down on the morning of, of December 14th, 1763. There were only six natives present in the town at that time. The rest of the natives were out selling their, their baskets and their brooms and such. The, the government in Lancaster protected the, the remaining Conestogas by placing them in the Lancaster jail. And then two weeks later, the Paxton boys came in and massacred them as well. Now, that is, from the Paxton boys' perspective, that is the end of the Native Americans in Lancaster County. However, we know that many Many saw these kinds of things coming as Europeans were encroaching on, the, on them. They moved further west and such. And there were many people that, that claimed descent from these Native Americans that lived at Conestoga. We even have the stories from the other side. If you go up to, to the Seneca, up to the areas of the Great Lakes and such, some of those Native Americans say, yes, we have this story that we lived at Conestoga. But we, we got out. Um, we know the story of the massacre, but but um, they, they left beforehand and such. So there are people that, that um, there are Native Americans even today that claim descent from, from, from these people that live there. Um, and there are Native Americans that live here in Lancaster County today, too. We have representation from the Seneca, from the Delaware, um, from the Piscataway, the Kanoi, uh, and from the Nanakook as well here in Lancaster County. So with that, I don't know what time it is, but I think I will stop and uh, maybe have a little time for questions. Would that be all right, Doug? Yeah, we're good, Doug. We're good? OK. Yeah. OK, yeah. So a little time for questions? Yeah, in the back. Were the Conestogas and the Susquehannocks the same people? Yes. Yeah. And when, were, they, were they governed by the Iroquois? Yes. This is, okay. Um, it, it's always more complex than just a yes or no, right? But, yeah. but um, the Susquehannocks are a subset of the Iroquois. They speak the Iroquois language, a subset of the Iroquois. And if you think of the Iroquois as the Six Nations, the Susquehannocks are a Seneca subset of the Iroquois. Okay. So they come through the Seneca and then back to the Iroquois. Now, they weren't here before the mid-1400s. They, they lived up in the Finger Lakes. The origins, like the ancestors of the Susquehannock people would have been what's now New York, upstate New York, Finger Lakes area. They come down here because of something that happened globally in the early 1400s. We had, we had it, it's the same thing that, the, remember the Vikings settled in, in, in Greenland and then that, that colony died out around the same time? It's because we had this little mini ice age for a few decades, it got colder. The Vikings in, in Greenland could not survive anymore in Greenland. It was too cold. And these guys were growing corn up in the Finger Lakes. So due to pressure of not having the growing season like they did before and such, some of them moved south. Not all of them. Some of them did. They simply couldn't grow enough food to stay for all of them to stay up there. Some of them moved south. They were people that lived here before they moved in here. But we call them, we don't know what they call themselves. Uh, we know that they were Algonquin speaking people because of the pottery and such that, that we see, but we call them the Shanks Fair 